began my career in Paris in 1991 as a fashion designer. It was a time of deep economic crisis. The stock market crash had led to high unemployment and, as a consequence, homelessness. I was working as a designer, designing clothes, beautiful clothes for the elite. But I began to question fashion and its relevance. The sheer exuberance of the Paris fashion shows and their disconnect with society. I asked myself, would I really spend that much money on a frock? And then I met the Argentine artist, Jorge Orta, who later became my husband. I was inspired by his socially engaged practice and feeling the need to become more engaged myself and find a new creative medium with which to express the problems in society. Jorge and I began collaborating together, provoked by three questions. How can art provide new insight into the problems in this world? How can we fuse aesthetics and social function? And how can artists contribute to social and environmental sustainability? These three questions became the heart and soul of our practice. Given the economic recession, and the homeless situation that was affecting the once prosperous city of Paris, I began creating these artworks, the first one here, the Habitant. It's a one-person tent that transforms in a matter of seconds into a poncho. I created refuge wear and body architecture, drawing from my skills as designer to make clothing that converts into shelter. As you can see, these are tents, bivouacs, and sleeping bags that convert into jackets and rucksacks. I met people living on the streets, and they told me their stories. We staged performances to draw more attention to the issues. I was invited to talk about my work in the media, and I won a prize for innovation. I could finally see that clothing was a universal and provocative way of talking about the issues. Jorge and I began collaborating together for the next 20 years, experimenting with all kinds of materials, painting, drawing, sculpting, photography, video, and even eating. We were conscious that the forms could not just represent our changing times. On the contrary, they needed to be active, act as triggers for solutions for society at large. We began working on environmental and social works and themes, and we knew one needed more attention, and that was of water scarcity. In 1995, we were invited to the Venice Biennial. We wanted to purify the water of the Grand Canal. Can you imagine artworks that can purify the filthiest waters in Europe into drinking water. And you can go up to a sculpture, turn on the tap, take a drink of clean water, and partake in that miracle. We did that. Four years later, we were invited on a research trip to Cairo in Egypt. We wanted to visit the Zabalin community. Zabalin in Egyptian Arabic means the garbage people. And this community recycle the garbage from the city of Cairo. If you've wandered the back streets of Cairo, you may have noticed thousands of tiny plastic bags scattered across the streets. It makes the city look dirty. But in fact, this greatly helps the Zabalin community, who come and collect them every day in order to survive. There are 70,000 Zabalin living on a mountain range called Mokatam. Piles and thousands of accumulated waste are in their homes. The conditions are absolutely appalling. Entire families, including young children, are recycling garbage. Here amongst the debris, we noticed these bundles containing plastic objects. And we wondered if it was possible to take the water container and create beautiful objects with that with us ourselves. 
but we were faced with a number of issues. Water is a vital resource, yet it's been transformed into a bottle commodity. But all of these bottles help the Zabelin to survive. But water is a major plastic pollutant. Since the 1950s, huge plastic islands are floating in our oceans, 3.5 million tons of plastic particles. Scientists call it the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. It's more than twice the size of Texas, and that's more than 16 times the size of the United Arab Emirates. But for all of these reasons, the bottle and the ecological, social and environmental messages it passes is a wonderful subject for artists. It's a brick that we can assemble together to create shapes, just like those bundles we saw in Mokotam. Thinking about all of those plastic islands containing the debris the memories of human consumption and our desire to gain control over our natural resources. These drawings began emerging from our sketchbooks. They began to resemble clouds. We decided to pursue this idea further. The nebulous shape of the cloud, devoid of form, is a wonderful subject for artists. It carries the message of water as a natural resource. And it's an amazing machine, a machine that recycles and distributes water across our planets. On our return from Egypt, we began by assembling the recycled bottles together. We inserted our objects and stabilized them using a technique of paper mache, using paper and glue. We smoothed out the forms with resin coatings and painted them with metallic paints, which picks up the light and brings out the natural peaks and crevices of the clouds. Furthermore, we had a desire to share water issues with young people, and we staged this giant outdoor workshop with the students in the School of Architecture in Versailles. We exhibited the work in the Louvre Museum's galleries in Versailles. Can you imagine? our water bottles, our recycled bottles, next to these Greek and Roman sculptures. We created an upside-down boat with buckets escaping. It's a capsized vessel, yes, but it's collecting the rainwater. And we have a raft symbolized by these oars. And you can actually ascend into the clouds using our ladder. We even created wearable clothes, turning full circle for my desire for fashion to be able to talk about environmental issues. Just six months ago, we won a prestigious competition for the International St. Pancras train station in London to take down the Olympic rings and create a suspended sculpture for the 19th century Barlow Shed, one of London's most famous landmarks. The competition brief asked us to think about this beautiful atrium, the steel and the glass, and to engage with the one million visitors that pass through that station every week. Of course, this was a daunting request. The clock alone measures five meters, and our sculpture needed to span 20 meters across. But we were challenged by the idea that we could create a focal point and transform the journey of those passengers through the station. And we instinctively knew that clouds would be the right work to share. We created two cumuli, reminiscent of our imaginary drawings as children. And we placed travelers on them, evoking the idea of a magic carpet as if they were floating in the skies, journeying along. And we called the work Meteorus from ancient Greek. It means in the midst of, lofty, between heaven and earth. We hope that the visitors, those one million visitors that come to the station every week will look up, and yes, their journey will be transformed. 
But our clouds and the meteorous work carry a deeper message, questioning water as a natural resource and how humans will share it in the future. We want these artworks to empower and to allow the audience to think about nature's gift that we need to protect and share equitably. If you look up to the skies and you see our clouds, maybe you too will be reminded of this gift that we need to use wisely. Our clouds are a call to action. <laughs>